Welcome to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Syracuse legend Derek Coleman. I talked with Derek about his efforts to provide for minority students at SU, the coming back together weekend, the promise he made to his mother when he came to SU, and the truth behind the infamous fight between SU athletes and a fraternity. Well, welcome back to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, and we are in for a treat today. Um, Our guest is a guy who I've been trying to get on this podcast since before we even started recording this podcast. (laughs) Um, It's the legend of 44. It's former Syracuse star, um, Derek Coleman. Derek, how are you, sir? I'm good, Mike. I'm still waiting on my articles. (laughs) <laughs> so if you're going to tell the story, tell the whole story why I haven't gotten on your podcast. Derek Derek wanted me to send him a copy of every single story that I wrote on him during his playing days, yes. which probably numbers in the thousands. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I wanted you to do that because I'm really thinking about writing my memoirs. And I definitely want to start with Syracuse University because it's been such a, a huge part you know, of my life. And I tell people that all the time, my four years at Syracuse was the best time in my life still to this day. I hear that from so many guys yes. like yourself. I hear it from Billy Owens. I hear yes. it from Lawrence Moton, you know, guys who went on and played in the pros and had you know, stellar careers and then beyond that. They've gone on to great things in, in, in the business world. And yet they all say about it was the best time of their lives. It Why is, is that, Derek? Because, I mean, the friendships that we all develop at, at that time in our lives. And you, it's really a situation where it's, it's boys growing into young men. You know, uh, the relationships, the people in Syracuse um, have just been fantastic, you know, to us. and. It's a time of your life, Mike, really, where you, you're really free, you know, like we're learning that as we grow at that time. And again, developing the friendships and relationships that I have still to this day. I mean, my best friends are my friends from Syracuse University, you know, and I enjoy the time that we spend together, the conversations that we still have to this day. And definitely when we're back on campus, it's like deja vu all over again. Yeah, I remember a few years back, it was about 10 years ago now, it was the very first fantasy camp that Jim Beheim yeah. put on. And I got to kind of be a fly on the wall and participate because it was the first time ever. So they kind of, you know, they wanted to get the, the publicity out and yes, have somebody, yes. you know, write. And so I, I, and I remember one day at breakfast and I'm sitting there at the end of a table and it's guys like yourself and Herman Harid and some other guys, and you're all just giggling down there, laughing with each other. It's like the high school lunch table with you guys. <laughs> That's all we do when we get together, man. It's just, it is comedy central when we're together. And it's, it's, it's kind of like hard to explain. You know, it's like when I share stories with all the other guys that I know that played in different colleges and universities, they don't have a core group, a network like that with their teammates. And, you know, with us, Mike, it's really all generations, all age groups. But we have that passion and love, you know, for each other. And like you said, it's like being in high school at the lunchroom table, man, because that's all we do is laugh and, and crack jokes and, and talk about each other and, and everything. Well, your connection to the school is is pretty strong. And uh, one reason I wanted to have you on the podcast and the reason that you finally relented and came on because <laughs> is, is because we wanted to talk about something very important that's coming up here soon at, at the university, and that's the Coming Back Together weekend. Yes. Um, can you just explain for the listeners what Coming Back Together is? So CBT is a program. I actually think it started... Um, 19, I think 85, 84 was the first year that it started with CBT really is coming back together for all the black and Hispanic alumni at Syracuse University. 
where we go out and we raise money for kids who want to attend the university but don't have the finances to do it. So, yeah, you might get accepted to Syracuse, but you know what? You might need room and board. You might need tuition. You know, you might need books or whatever have you. So we raise money through different scholarships program with our time has come to support those kids who want to attend the university. So um, I think 2017, the first year we started talking about it, I said, hey, guys, you know what? We need to just have a celebrity basketball game you know, get all of us back on campus and have fun, raise money, you know what I'm saying? But really share the word with everybody that, you know, how great CBT has been. And we're just looking to expand it to a whole different level. So the game has been been great. The first year we did the game, I coached against Billy Owens. I won. I'm still waiting on my trophy. You know what I'm saying? I refuse to coach the game this year until you present my trophy. OK, <laughs> but it, it was great. I mean, Soledad O'Brien was, was there. Vanessa Williams was there, but it was a great time. And we did it actually in the heart of Syracuse at one of the high schools. So I yeah, think at Henniger. Big, at Henniger. So I think one of the biggest things is, Mike, is that, you know, the university in itself, we don't include the city of Syracuse in everything that we we do. And that was one of the things that was big for me to let people know in the city of Syracuse how much we love and appreciate them. And this year, the Coming Back Together weekend is the weekend of uh, basically begins on Thursday, the September yep. 9th, extends mm-hmm. through the weekend. Uh, but the basketball game, the celebrity game, is going to be at the Carrier Dome on Thursday, September 9th. Yes. Now, so you- I remember the, the other game that you were talking about in 2017, you had – Lawrence Moten, I think, played. Yeah, Brittany, Lawrence, Brittany Sykes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people played. Katie Kalinske. Yeah. Uh, oh, the, man, the Katie was it up. <laughs> he did. She was making threes and, and, yes. and killing people. Yeah, now, I, I had Brittany Reese on, on, on my team, and I called a timeout. And when she came to the huddle, I said, Brittany, you let Katie score one more time, I'll sit your ass down on this bitch. She's like, I got a D. I got her. <laughs> So who's playing this year? It's it's just an opportunity, again, for all of us to interact and have fun. It's something that we love doing. So Demetrius Nichols, John, and John was on my team. John Wallace, like I said, Eric, Eric Devendo, Lawrence Moulton. Um, I think Felicia Leggett is going to, going to coach and play uh, Vera Jones. You know, I don't know if Brittany, I know we sent the invitation out to her. Rob Drummond is going to play. Uh, Don McPherson is there. Like, I got a whole list of this. Who the who's who of Syracuse University that's participating in, in this game? And uh, again, it's for a worthy cause, a great cause, and raising money, you know, for those kids. But it gives us an opportunity to really get together as we do, but to share the love and passion that we have for the university. Now, if, in terms of tickets, is the uh, Syracuse uh, carried on box office? Is that the yeah, easiest place? Yeah, you- you can get the tickets at, at the dome, and then we also have an online mic. I don't know exactly what that is right now. Let me look on my phone uh, where you can also get tickets to come to the game and participate. And it's the first showing of the new of the carrier dome. You know the the big right. screen, the, the the new bells and whistles in the carrier dome. So we're going to break the floor in first. You know, so <laughs> and we also talk about getting Coach Beheim to come and actually. Uh, commentate like a half of the basketball game as well. So it's going to be fun, man. It's really just creating an atmosphere for us to enjoy each other, but also do some for worthy calls. Now, what else takes place over the weekend with coming back together after you get past the basketball game? Oh, I mean, we have workshops. We have um, different events planned on through the whole weekend, all the way up until, until Sunday. So you will have, you have workshops, you will have events planned. We have, uh, some of Syracuse alumni guys who have actually written books, you know, so we'll have book signings like in the shrine for people to come in and, and um, you know, autograph and sign books. We'll also have uh, a lot of fraternity and sororities that are doing different stuff. So they're, they intertwine with the fraternity and sorority, the kids that are there now, you know, so it's kind of like a huge mentoring awareness program. We, we're having um, job creation a lot of people there at the University of Syracuse that using our alumni base to really connect with those students that are at Syracuse right now and create job opportunities for them. 
So the whole through Thursday through Sunday is something going on. And I'll have to get you a copy of the whole itinerary for that, that weekend. So it sounds like a lot of this stuff is, is you're reaching out. You're not only raising money, but you're reaching out to the current students. Yes, exactly. Because it's really to benefit them. It benefits them, but also, Mike, what we have to do in life, you know, it's all about passing the torch, mm-hmm. you know. So to get them engaged and involved in their first CBT, because, again, eventually we're going to have to pass it on to the next generation. So we try to engage them as much as possible about what it is at this university and how we represent it at the university. But more than anything, how are you guys going to represent when we're gone? You know, these efforts are, are admirable and necessary, but, yeah. you know, still the university is predominantly white. Um, really? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to break it to you. Yes, it is. Um, does some of this help the current students to connect with alumni such as yourself that maybe followed the same path to get there and, and, and show a way that, you know, hey, this can be part of my network when I leave. And it's, yes. it's, 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 it's kind of nice to see people that look like you. Yes, um, always. Always, Mike. Images is everything. So we have um, panels that we sit on and talk about. So even um, this year, we're going to have Rodney Dumpson, who played with Paul and Gary Gate in, in lacrosse, come and talk about his experience at Syracuse being one of the only black lacrosse players to ever play on, on, on the team. Right. So, you know, again, bringing awareness to that, what does that look like? You know, and being able to show that with that generation, like everybody thinks, and as we, when we were kids, we thought the same thing, like nothing's being reinvented or created. We've done it before. So the same problems that you kids are having, we had those same problems at the university, but you know what? We're trying to create the opportunity where you have somebody really you can relate and talk to. I'm always big on, on image and just what you say, image is everything. When I can let my barriers, my walls down and communicate with people that look just like me. Like I can share my whole life story with guys that play basketball because they've been through all the struggles that I've been through. I just can't open up and share that with somebody who hasn't been through those struggles. It, it takes me a while. It's like me talking to you. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into our relationship in a minute. <laughs> we, we should really let our, we, we should really let the listeners in on this. Um, you know, before we get there though, it doesn't surprise me that you are such, um, have, have taken such a big role in CBT because it seemed to be just a natural part of, of, of your, of your nature. Cause yeah. I know you're doing a lot of this same sort of stuff back in uh, home in Detroit. Well, um, it, it's in my DNA and who I am. I, I've been raised this way my whole life. You know, a lot of things in, in, in my lifetime over the past 30 years, I've never changed. I've been the same person re- regardless. You know, I'm still going to tell you how I feel and what I feel about it. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is what it is, you know, but I'm going to explain it to you, but I'm going to show you how, hey, man, how we can get over it, you know, right. together. And I, I think we become in society so passive about everything. You know, we got to always watch what we say, watch what we do. And society as a whole has become that way. But when you become that way, okay, how are we going to be able to explain to kids like life isn't fair? And you got to have priorities. You got to have some discipline. You got to have some get up and go about yourself. And that's all I try to do to explain to kids. Okay, so what? What are you going to do about it? You know? Like you can't sit here and pout about it because when you step outside those doors, whether it's at Syracuse University on campus, whether it's in the neighborhoods and communities where we grew up at, you know what I'm saying? You're mm-hmm. still going to face roadblocks and obstacles. What are you going to do to get over those roadblocks and those obstacles? Take me through some of the the, the, the things that you are doing back there in Detroit, though, because I, I know like one, you're, you're doing a lot with youth basketball, right? Well, it's, it's so funny. My mom used to say that all the time. Why do you run away from the thing that you love the most? And I used to laugh at her. I say, because my, it's so much more 
that I want to be in life. Like basketball is such a small part of all of our lives and playing. And there's so much more that I want to do. So I've been an advocate for youth basketball because for me, it's just a way, Mike, for us to get to college. Mm-hmm. Without basketball, I could never won a scholarship to attend Syracuse University. And 30 years later, our kids are still going through the same thing. So has the system failed us on what we're talking about doing? So I just try to get the youth to understand, like, hey, this is a tool. You have to use that tool. I don't care what kind of ball it is, but you use that tool to get an opportunity to go to school. I'm the first one in my family to go to college. The very first. Mm -hmm. But I set the tone for the generations that come behind me. You know, my cousins are now, I got two of my cousins who are doctors. You know, yeah. I set the tone, yeah, for for them, you know, to go to school, to want to go to school. My cousin Tracy, she owns her own daycare center. She started off going to school being a dentist. And then when she got home, she flipped it like, yo, I want to run the daycare. I want to do that. So, but she was like, Derek, without you going to school and me coming up to Syracuse, visiting you, you know what I'm saying? That inspired me to want to go to college. I said, before that, I never wanted to even, you know, go to school. I know what I want to do. So there's so many kids that are confused, you know what I'm saying, like that. So I use the basketball, again, as the carrot. To dang, I don't worry about basketball. I do basketball in my sleep. But the thing is, what I love to do is expose kids to everything else that goes on in life. Because through basketball, you're going you're gonna to travel. You're going to stay at hotels. You're going to meet people from all walks of life through the game of basketball. And one thing with basketball is that we don't care. I don't care what's your race, your religion, your gender, or whatever. Are you going to help me win? That's all we care about. <laughs> You know, you mentioned that you were like the first one in your family to go to college. Yes. And you went to college for four years from 87 to 91. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until a few years ago that you completed that degree. And I remember talking with you about it. Um, you did it for a very special reason. I mean, you, you had played yeah. this huge career. You had gone to the NBA and we know you had made your money and all that stuff. But what was it, four or five years ago when you went back? Uh, well, I was actually, when, when online classes started, I don't know exact like year when they, when they started, first of all, me and my mother had a huge argument about that. It, it, it wasn't really an argument. It was just like, cause my junior year, I was really going to leave school. So we were having conversations about that. And she was like, well, what about school? And I'm like, what about it? You know, I said, I went to school, yeah, to get an education and perfect my craft. I say, but here, here it is. I'm a junior in college and I got an opportunity to change our life, to change yeah. your life. You're still, I'm walking you, when I come home in the summertime, I'm walking you to the bus stop, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning for you to go to work. I got an opportunity right now to change that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not thinking, school is the last thing that's on my mind right now. I'll get back to that later. You know, so we had this, this huge argument about and I'm like I hear what you're saying mom but you ain't hearing what I'm saying I got an opportunity to change that right now I'm good you know how my parents are don't worry about me I'm gonna I'm be okay so when so this is about to be the only argument Derek Coleman ever lost because I know how it turns out pretty much yeah <laughs> pretty much but I never even told her that I was taking online classes so even when I was still playing when when the classes came out I just started taking classes and I only need I think like 12 credits you know, to, to graduate. So I started going back to school online, taking the classes. I never even told my mother that I was, was doing it. And it was mother's day. And I, uh, the university sent me a copy of my diploma and I gave it to her. We went to Sunday brunch on mother's day and I gave it to her. And she thought it was a family portrait of me, my wife and and my kids. And when she unwrapped it and saw it, it was actually my degree Oh, man, she just broke down. (laughs) But again, you know, I'm a person that I try to finish everything that I start, Mike. And one of the biggest things for me was that, you know, when you start having kids of your own, it's like, okay, I'm not going to let my kids graduate from college before I do. 
You know, I'm, I'm not yeah, going to let that, you're right that there. Happen. regardless of how successful I've been in, in life, like education is still important, you know what I'm saying, to me, whether I use my degree or not. And I tell the story all the time because, again, as kids, when we're at Syracuse, I'm 17, 18 years old. I don't know what I want to do in life, you know. Like I had so much fun, Mike, in my speech communications classes. And actually me and Mike Tarico was in the same class. Really? Right? Yeah. We're in the same class. But it was going to take up so much of my time that I would miss practice. Mm-hmm. Right? So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out again, what am I going, going to do? You know, and I wind up choosing sociology. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I remember it like yesterday, I'm sitting on my bed the summer of my junior year going into my senior year. I'm, I'm sitting on my bed and it's like somebody just smacked me in the face. Like, what are you doing? And I'm sitting there having a conversation with myself. Like, what do you mean? What am I doing? He was like, you're going to get a degree in sociology. She's like, you love communication because I love my communication class. And we set up in the studios and all that. And Professor Rick Wright was my teacher. So again, when you go back, talk about image. Image is everything. So legendary professor at Syracuse University. Yeah. So I'm sitting in there and I'm like, man, you're talking about getting a degree in in sociology. You've been dealing with social problems your whole life. You already got a master's in that. (laughs) I get up, I go to the basketball office. Terry McDonald at the time was our advisor. I say, Terry, I want to change my degree back to communications. All of my credits wouldn't transfer. And that's why I didn't, I didn't do it. But I tell kids that to this day, if it's something that you're passionate about, follow your passion, you know? And I'm, I'm mad at myself because I all my credits wouldn't transfer for me to actually go into Newhouse to do right. communications, which I loved it. I had so much fun doing it, being on campus, interviewing people, you know what I'm saying? I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't enough time for me, you know, to do that and miss practice. So what did your mom actually eventually say that convinced you to go back for your senior year? Oh, I don't remember. I mean, I, I can't even tell you. It was between her, you know, and my uncle and, and, and Dave, you know, uh, being, you know, and, and I would say the biggest conversation, though, was really with, with Coach Behan. You know, really? um, sitting in his office, and me and him were sitting there, and he was like, look. He said, Derek, you could have left school after your freshman year if you wanted to. You know, he said, they're pre- projecting you right now to go top five in your junior year. And, and for me, I don't know if you remember, I had back spasms when we went into the tournament, I think I even missed one or two of the first games that we, we played. And I just feel that myself personally, I didn't have a great year, you know, I'm like, but I'm sitting in coach's office and he's telling me, you know, what I'm projecting and everything. And he's like, you know, I know you, he said, wouldn't it be great for you to come back and have a great senior year and go number one. And I said, yeah, coach, you're right. It would be. You know, and I'm sure he had his own personal reasons as well. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> number one, he, yeah, <laughs> he starts out the next year with the best player in the country on his roster. And me and Stevie Thompson wind up being, you know, this winning as two guys in, in Syracuse history. I think Demetrius was it Demetrius Nichols? No, it was uh, what's it called? I, I think him and Howard, uh, Brandon Trish, Brandon Trish broke it. Yeah, broke the record, man. All right, but so again, you said you didn't feel like you had a good year your junior year. I just want to let, – let's, let's, let's have a little fun here. All Derek Coleman did as a junior was average 16.9 points and 11.4 rebounds. You blocked 127 <laughs> shots. <laughs> and, um, and your team went to the Elite Eight. It wasn't – And you wanted it, to come back. <laughs> because, again, like I said, and, and I'm playing out. I'm playing, but my back is killing me the whole time. I don't know if you remember, I would come out of the game and lay on the floor. I, I would never even sit in the seat. My back was bothering me. So, 
again, I, I looked at that as, yeah, good, but senior year can be better. But overall, though, Mike, I was having a great time. I was enjoying college. Mm. I stress that more than any. I don't care where you go to school at, man. It's, it's, it's so much fun. I mean, Syracuse is just, it's just different. It's just different, man. You know, I love hearing that you look back and you talk about how much fun it was and it's great for years because I came to Syracuse halfway through your junior year, mm -hmm. halfway through that season. And it's about January of 89. And I start to cover the team then. I'm, I'm an outsider. I'm from Tennessee. Yeah. And you were already in the headlines then as I got into town. There had been some trouble on campus. I don't, look, look, don't say trouble because there never starts trouble. Say what the trouble, what was the trouble? I, let me hear the trouble. I'm going to give you the story. I'm going to give you the exclusive right now. What was the well, trouble? Well, I don't want to taint the audience. I'm just going to sit back and hand over control of the podcast to you and you can take me through it. <laughs> what was the trouble? What I do? Well, what, there was, sorry, there, what, there was what a, did you say I did? There was something on campus, a disturbance at like a party that started at Shine. And then eventually, wasn't the story that like, okay, didn't I, you kick I, in a door? No, I never kicked. They said I kicked in the door. I never kicked Good. the door in. We can set the record straight now. You have yes. the floor. Yes. So it was, a, it was a fraternity party at the Shine. I got that part right. Yes. Deval Glover, Chris Ingram, rest his soul. They're at the party. The fraternity guys, I don't know what happened, beat them up. I'm in the bar. All of us, and me, Billy, everybody, we're in the bar. Somebody runs to the bar and comes to get us. Like, uh, one of the fraternities beat up Chris Ingram. So we go around to the party to see what was going on. So we get to the to the shine at the, at the time it was called the underground we get to the underground oh. and the fight break out between the fraternity and the athletes so those guys run back up the sky top and some of us go back up the sky top looking for those guys but yeah. i never kicked the door in and they tried to say i kicked them no i never kicked the door in but Somebody kicked one of the doors in, and I don't know, it took one of the guys radio or TV or something like that. So that's really how it all, like, escalated. Oh, if Derek Coleman kicked the door in, they took our TV, they took our – come on, man. I don't need your TV or your, or your radio. But, again, I've never started any trouble that I've been in at Syracuse. Now I'll finish it. <laughs> I ain't got no problems in finish it at, at all. Yeah, but I don't, I don't never start nothing. Yeah. So here I am, a wet behind the ears reporter thrown in to cover this team of personalities, unbelievable, including yourself. And this whole mess is going on. It was really hard as a reporter to connect with you at that time because, and I don't know if you agree or not, but. At that point, you 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 had set up like a veneer, a, a wall, because I don't think there was a lot of trust at that point with, with you and any media. Never had, never had. And, yeah. and I was brand new. So you yeah. didn't know me at all. Yeah, yeah. Remember never, that? Never, never has been. And I, I I think you know I blame Coach Bayheim for that because really? he because he's never had no communication <laughs> with the media either. <laughs> So we we took on the same image that he took on, you know, very, very short with the media, you know, conversation. I mean, he's gotten better with it over the years. It's kind of like the same situation with John Thompson in Georgetown. Mm. You know, John never let his guys talk, you know, what I'm saying, to the media or anything. And, and my problem has never been, you know, with the media, just like it's dictating the stories. You know, it's no matter what I say, like, yeah, me, you having this conversation right now and, you know, it's live. So it's coming directly from me. It's not like I'm telling you a story and then, you know, media will 
take bits and pieces of the story to make it to a whole different story that I never even even said. So I've always had that problem. I've always been cautious of that. And I'm like, you know what? From now on in my life, I'm going to control my own narrative. I'm going to tell the story. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you the, the truth in it, you know, and, and everything. I'm not going to let anybody else tell, tell my story. I'm going to control the pen. I remember the first time I had even an inkling that we were going to end up maybe having a slightly better relationship reporter. You know, <laughs> it was after you were done at Syracuse, you had been in the pros for several years. You might've been in Philadelphia. And I don't know if you remember this, but you came back and I had an occasion to interview you and you said, yeah, I used to think you guys here in Syracuse were bad until I got to Philadelphia. <laughs> You know, I don't look, remember I, that. I've been in media outlets in my life. I mean, come on. I started out in Jersey. You know, terrible. You know what I mean? And then I go to Philly, it got even worse. You know, <laughs> and it, well, what you understand too, I think people don't understand that. You know, a lot of guys, you know, hey, man, I just want to come and do my job. You know, I want to play basketball I want to have fun and yeah I don't have any problems having a conversation you know with the media because I know you guys have a job to do as well but if you're going to write the story write the story exactly how I'm telling you the story you know don't pick and choose what you're going to leave in or take out or whatever have you so I think a lot of guys have problems you know dealing with with that side of it and that's why you see a lot of guys just have um managers or you know PR people or whatever so we're, we're before all of that you know mm -hmm. yeah and I mean same way when I when I went to Jersey so imagine imagine this Mike imagine you're the number one pick you go into a franchise that hasn't won and God knows when right and you're 19 20 I, I probably was 20 21 when I grad you know left school yeah and you're asked to lead a franchise and one of the biggest media outlets in the world at 20, 21 years old. And that's a lot. It, and with no guidance from anybody, even my, my, the veteran guys that I had on the team, you know, they're quiet, you know, Hey, no, nah, young fella, we going we going to ride your back, you know, your coattail on this thing. So when I look at stuff like that, my life has really been trial and error, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I made mistakes, you know what I'm saying? I've done great things. But for me, every time that I've made a mistake in life, I've always just admitted to it and moved on. You know, like I don't dwell on it at all. Just like, yo, okay, yeah, I did it. Next, you know, I'm gonna move on. With, I'm not going to going to dwell on the situation because that's a part of life. That's a part of growing, you know, growing up that you're going to make mistakes in life. It's just that my mistakes in life and me being the person that I am is always being magnified, you know? So I had my daughter, my daughter did something crazy the other day. She Googled me. It's like, dad, I Googled you and your mug shot came up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I said, yeah. I said, well, baby, that's something I'm not proud of, but, yeah, so I explained the story. You know, like, you were speeding, Dad? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was speeding, you know. But Where was I this? Oh, it was a, a while ago, you know, when she was probably a kid. Okay. Yeah, but again, wow. you can still, you're talking 15, 20 years ago, but you can still pull that up, you know. So, again, I explained it, and I, I moved forward, yeah. I, I was speeding. I got pulled over, you know, police took me to jail, took my mug shot, you know. But the next day I was right back at my basketball camp. Like, yeah, he was like, coach, well, I'm like, yeah, coach was speeding, but come on, let's get into these drills. Let's go. Don't worry about that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I wanted, we got to talk about two men who I know played big roles in your life. And, and one was a guy that is a Syracuse grad, but he was a, 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 a big uh, legendary guy in Detroit, Dave Bing. <laughs> what can, bingo yeah what can you tell me about what he's 
what he did for you as, as a young man and, in terms of being a mentor and everything, you? everything. Uh, I'm not the person that I am today if it wasn't for Dave being. Uh, meeting Dave when I was uh, 13 years old, my high school coach knew Dave, introduced me to Dave. At the time, I never even knew Dave even played basketball. <laughs> you know, because he, he was a, he was a businessman. Yeah, you know, running his own steel company and and everything, and um, got the chance to you know to have conversation with him. And, and at the time, you know, every age that I turned, Mike, my foot grew. When I was 12, I wore 12. When I was 13, I wore 13. 14, 14, 15, 15. So it was hard for me to find shoes growing up. And my coach, when he introduced me to Dave, was like, hey, man, you got to find this kid some shoes. <laughs> that could be a problem. Yeah, ex exactly. And um, met Dave, conversations with Dave. But again, when, when it's – through basketball, and at the time, not even knowing, I was going to see him one time at his, at his uh, business, and I'm standing in the lobby. You know, the receptionist, you know, call upstairs and like, well, he, he'll be with you in a minute, Derek. I'm like, okay. But it was a poster, you know, up on the wall. Um, and I'm looking at the poster. So I see Dr. J, you know, see Doc Afro, you know, going to the hole. Uh, I see Bob Lanier, you know. In a corner, I said, damn, that's Dave. You know, so when I get upstairs, I said, hey, man, you never told me you played basketball. He was like, it didn't matter, Derek. But I, when I found out who he was as a basketball person, that, like, opened our whole relationship up to what it is right now. Like you said, when you talk about barriers, all barriers are, are down because he understands everything as a businessman, a, a basketball player that I'm going through in life right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's been my mentor. He's been my pops. He's been my friend, my confidant. You know, he's been everything in my life still, you know, to this day. So me growing up seeing uh, Dave, you know, own his own business is, hey, I want to own my own business one of the day, you know? So again, image is, is everything is what you talked about, you know, earlier, man. And um, I still, you know, I just talked to Dave yesterday. Like, we still get together. We still have lunch and, and, and conversate because there's still a lot more stuff for us to do. And even with his mentoring program, which I'm a part of, you know, but who's better to tell the story than me? Because without you being my mentor growing up, who knows where I've been and, and what the outcome, you know, would, would have been in my life. So, no, man, that's, that's, that's my guy. I love him to death. Did he direct you or encourage you to go to Syracuse? Of course. <laughs> All right. So, so think of, think about that. You know, at 13 years old was my first time I actually came to Syracuse uh, basketball camp. Wow. Yeah. So Dave, in the summertime, he's like, "Hey, get you out of the city." You know, um, coach them is having a basketball camp in Syracuse. You want to go? I'm like, "Yeah." You know. So me and, and my friend, he's a coach here now, Steve Hall. He coaches at Cass Tech High School here in Detroit. Me and Steve used to go because Steve Hall, dad, used to work for Dave. So me and Steve okay. used to come to Syracuse basketball camp every summer. And then as I got, you know, 15, 16 year, years old, my whole team would come, you know, with us wow. to Syracuse basketball camp. And I mean, as a kid, to actually be on a university, I mean, again, that's eye-opening in, in itself. You yeah. know, so being there on campus and then to walk into the carrier dome, you know what I'm saying? At 13 years old, like, man, what in the heck is this? <laughs> you know, so I was always, you know, a part of Syracuse being one of my final choices, you know, to go to school and everything. But because of Dave and I wanted to break all his records, so. That was the other part of it. <laughs> oh, you did that too. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to have some bragging rights. <laughs>
So what was your first impression of Jim Beheim? Coach? Oh, my God. Oh, uh, back then, I would say Coach was a lot more funnier than he is now. Really? Funnier then? Yeah, always, always like sneak quiet snaps, you know, always. Um, his competitive edge, I, I, I've always liked. I might not agree with him all the time, but you know what? I always loved him and respected him for his knowledge of the game of basketball and what, you know, he accomplished in that. And I, I just think always thought it was great to always have opinions and no matter what you do in life, you know, you might not agree with everything, you know, that a person says, but, you know, I got an opinion too. It's different than, yeah, coach, I know you stand on the sideline coaching, but I'm out here in this game playing. And I'm seeing what's going on. And I'm tired of these guys double teaming me, okay? So we need to run <laughs> something else. <laughs> but always, always love Coach. Always, you know, had fun, fun with him, you know, just as much as uh, uh, Bernie Fine. You know, Bernie Fine is the heart and soul of Syracuse University. Always have, you know, been. You know, so I have the utmost respect, you know, for those guys. And I heard Coach tell tell Julie that one time. It's like, you want to like Derek if you was here with when he was here with me. <laughs> because I always used to challenge him. You know, always yeah. he, he tells us to do something. I was just always asking why. You know, like, why, Coach? Why we got to do that? Why I got to play center, Coach? I, I ain't come here to play center, Coach. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yep. Uh, you mentioned Bernie. Um, and I, I know from talking to a lot of guys that, that he was really important, uh, to yeah. them, that he was the guy that kind of kept in touch with guys when they left and made sure yeah. that they, they, they maintained contact to the program. Does it, does it bother you, uh, with the way you know, his whole career ended and, and the fact that he's really not a part of this program at all? Oh, without, uh, without question, it, it bothers me to this day. And I mean, I still talk to Bernie. Like Bernie is is a, he is Syracuse, you know. All of us, we still communicate with Bernie, you know, all the time. So even with everything that was going on, I remember having a conversation with Daryl Gross. You know, I said I understand, you know, what's going on and how everything is going to play out. I said, but listen to me. You might not feel that right now. I say, but when Bernie Fine leaves, we're going to take four or five steps backwards because he was the glue. He was the connector to everybody. And I hated Bernie Fine. Well, I wouldn't say that, that I hate him. I disliked him. I don't really hate I don't think of anybody. But I, I, I disliked him, Mike, because it could be 530 in the morning, man. Bernie Fine is my door. It's a blizzard outside. I'm looking out the window. Hey, don't you got class at 7 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Bernie, it's a blizzard. What do you want at 5, 36 o'clock in the morning? You better get your ass up and get to class. If you don't, you're going to be running the dome steps. <laughs> I hate it, Bernie. I hated him. Everything I and again, like the same story I gave you, sitting at home on my bed and talking to myself. It, it came to me with Bernie the same way. Like, you know what? This guy loves you. He don't care about basketball. He care about you as a person, as a human being. He loves you. And at, that changed my whole perception with Bernie. Because I used to always challenge him as, as well, you know, with, with everything. And I, and I stopped because it, it, it dawned on me. It's like it, it clicked. You know, sometime in life, you know, we don't get stuff. And one day it just clicks. They say it happens in women and young ladies before it happened to us as men all the time. But it just clicked with me with, with Bernie. 
And I stopped right then. I stopped challenging him. Anything that he said to me or whatever, I'm like, okay, Burn. All right, Burn. What's up? Yep. Okay, Burn. Yeah, it just clicked with me. I'm like, man, because he really cares about you as a person, as a human being. It's bigger than basketball. Is there any chance you think he's ever welcomed back into the university community or the basketball? Like, does he does he ever make another appearance at the Dome or is that ship sailed? I, I think it's sailed. I mean, I would love, you know what I'm saying, to see that happen. But I think it's sailed because of um, just the changing of the times, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I've had conversations with Bernie, you know, uh, about that. And he's like, Derek, you know, I'm at peace with it. So I said, well, if you at peace with it, I'm at peace with it, Bernie. But it still doesn't really, everything that you put your heart and soul into this university, you know, for you to leave the way that that you left. Like it bothered, you know, all of us, still bothers us. You know, and I think it really puts a damper on him and coach's relationship, you know? Because here it is, you know, Y'all Batman and Robin before Bat, you know what I'm saying? Batman and Robin. And for that to happen, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure it just tainted with, with all of us because of the love that we have and the respect that we have for Bernie. So is there anybody you're excited about seeing when you come back to campus next week for coming back together weekend? <laughs> I'm excited about it. Well, I mean, always my teammates. You know, always the people that uh, I went to school with. Um, always, I mean, I, I'm I'm happy that Felicia is getting her jersey, you know, retired, and she's getting a award. Hopefully, I mean, she should be our next coach. Like, I don't know what what Syracuse, what y'all waiting on to make a decision. Like, that is a given. Like, what is the problem? I mean, what what's taking us so long? <laughs> We're really supposed to be orange, you know. Mm-hmm. That's a given. What, what, what are we waiting on? You know, she has the credentials. She's local. I think she would definitely bridge the gap between the university and the city of Syracuse, the disconnect that still goes on there. Um, I, I'm really shocked and amazed that Gary Gate Jersey hasn't been retired yet. Like when they said that, I'm like, wow. Like, what is the problem? And also what, what disappoints me is that it's Paul and Gary, okay? So Paul Jersey should be, number should be retired along with his brother. They played together. Gary, I Gary. agree. Yeah, so I, yeah. I don't know who's making those decisions. Hopefully this weekend we can I can meet those people and have those type of conversations. But for me, it's all about how do we keep connecting the dots at the university and bringing people together, you know, if we really supposed to be SU. So I look forward to, you know, like I say, the conversations and, and, and meeting, you know, my classmates and people like that, that I haven't seen because, you know, COVID has, uh, it's, it's taken a toll on all of us, you know, and, just to get out for a minute and see people have conversations with people that you you love. Hopefully everybody's vaccinated. I'm vaccinated. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying. So we yep. can really let our masks down and 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 be us, you know. But uh I, I just look forward to the whole experience, man. You know, my guy Mark Pryor, who ran track at Syracuse, you know, he um uh, is the um agent for uh, a, a couple of the Olympians. You know what I'm saying? So look forward to, to seeing him. I haven't saw him in two or three years. You know, yeah, we talk on the phone, but it's a different when you're able to embrace, you know what I'm saying, your friends and your loved ones. So that's what I, I really look forward to, man. Well, that'll be a, a special event. It's a it's a great one, too. I yeah. appreciate it, um, you know, and, 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 you know, acknowledge what you're doing for your university and, uh, and also the minority students uh, that are interested in going there. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. It's 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 again, man. We're we're all just vessels, Mike. You know, we're we're passing through. Mm-hmm. So you know, we just gotta pass the baton on to the next generation. Now you're actually gonna get through an entire podcast without shouting out my nickname that you got for me, the Dirty Waters. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey, yeah, there I'm it about is. to make you a shirt with that on it. <laughs> Dirty waters. <laughs> Well, hey, you know, Mike, we, with we NIL, I can I can benefit from it, right? We yeah, can, if, if we, any we shirt you sell. We had a great time. I, I really think that, like, me and you've had conversations, but that weekend we actually got a chance to, like, really sit down and have real, you know, conversation. I'm seeing you 8 o'clock in the morning to 4 or 5 o'clock, you know what I'm saying, that afternoon, and we're just having fun, you know, yeah, playing basketball, talking trash and, and everything, but just, you know, even we go to lunch and at dinner, we just have a real conversation. Yeah. It was great. Let's face it. It was when you knocked me out completely. Oh, out yeah, of my yeah. Well, I, definitely. I owed you that anyway. I, I wish all Syracuse reporters would have, would have came to the fantasy camp. <laughs> so they all could have gotten knocked out of their yeah, They all would have got knocked on their ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got up. Yeah, you um, did. You did. Yeah. But again, anyway. man, you know, really getting to know people is, is um, I think that's the greatest, one of the greatest things in, in life, you know, and realizing that, you know what, a lot of us still, we all come from the same background. We breathe the same air, you know, but having real life conversations and being able to take those conversations and, and, do something with it, you know? And I, that's why I look so forward to CBT is like really sitting down at the workshops and having, at the panels and having real conversation. Okay, guys, we're having these conversations, right? Okay, what's next? What are we gonna do about it? You know, can't just have conversations just to have conversations, you know? I remember like one of my first CBTs, like I said, me being still being in school and the person that impacted me the most that came and spoke was Jim Brown. Wow. Didn't sugarcoat it, you know, told us what it was like when he was at school at Syracuse, how he didn't even have a scholarship. You know, he had to earn it. You know, wow. yeah. And that always stuck with me because everybody always talk about, you know, their experience, but not to the heart and soul of their experience when I'm still a minority, a black man or a black woman, and I'm still at this university, but I'm still facing the same things I'm facing when I'm at home. So when those kids are up there protesting, mind you, all the time, we're on the phones, we're on Zoom calls or whatever. Hey man, I salute y'all. I'm gonna let y'all know that you got an ally right here with me and I will come up there. Because you're right, your voices need to be heard. And we have to keep moving the envelope. We got to keep pushing the envelope, Mike. You know, that's the only way we're going to make change in life. And we got to make change at our, at our university as well. It's inclusion. And don't, mm -hmm. just, don't just include us to include us because it looks good. You know, you check in yeah. the box. Don't just check the box. So a person like you who has the power of the pen, no, I can say it, but when a person like you, Mike, says it, people pay more attention to it because it's not a color. You know what I'm saying? When I say it, they're like, oh, well, you know, you, you, you just being, you know, radical or whatever. No, I'm telling you exactly what it is. But for a guy like you to say it's like, well, well maybe that's some truth to really what Derek is talking about because Mike agrees with him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you always got to have people to advocate for you on anything that you're, that you're doing. But I salute those kids, you know what I'm saying? Because when it's not right, it's not right. And we have to make it right. Yeah. Yep. I hear you. I, and uh, I think that's why it's so important to, to keep doing things like you're coming back together weekend yes. and keep that up. So yes, I, I salute you. Yes, sir. No doubt. Appreciate it. And I look I forward to seeing it. you. <laughs> You'll see me. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Oh, it's man. It's a pleasure. Don't wait on my articles. Now, I, I've been on here with you. This is the first and last. I guess I got to come through. Yeah, you got to come through for me, man. I got to start <laughs> that memoir. You know, I got I got to read all the bad shit that y'all said about me. <laughs> <laughs> And there you have it. There we go. <laughs> and flip.
skip it. You hear me? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're cutting uh, off the podcast now. Derek's had enough. Hey, bro. Appreciate it. <laughs> See you, sir.